So let's look at the latest data from UK's recession, latest data from Japan's recession, latest data from Germany's recession. Europe is basically in recession. And I do love these quotes. Oh, we're going to come out of this. I'm like, from what? Typically, it takes a long and variable lag from a significant period of Federal Reserve of Central Bank easing. That even even started yet. And where are they going to export to? China? China <laughs> needs to export to them. So th this is how bad it is. Welcome back to Sora Financially. Thank you so much for joining us on a channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the at JR Mining Guy on Twitter and the CEO of the Sora Financial Group. Really appreciate you joining us for a discussion that I think is going to be really, really interesting because we've got a market expert here joining us in a few short seconds. It's Mike McClone. He's a senior commodity strategist over at Bloomberg Intelligence. He's been a guest about four months ago for the first time, and it's time for a follow-up. A lot of the macro indicators have changed. And uh, and I'll have some following some follow up questions on on certain commodities as well, oil, nickel, but also gold price. Of course, we need to discuss what is happening. Where is the floor right now? And uh, how is copper behaving? Is copper still Dr. Copper for us? And where is that big recession? Of course. So lots to discuss in a very short time. We'll pack a lot of information in. Quick reminder, hit that subscribe button so we can bring guests like Mike back on the channel more regularly as well. And it tells us also if you like our content. Really appreciate it. Now, enough of my babbling. Let me bring Mike on. Mike, thank you so much for hey, joining guys. us again. It's good to see you. Hello. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mike, I warned you, I might actually steal one of your questions that you post on Twitter as the lead into our conversation, because I think it's a, it's a good macro start. And the question is, you posted it on Twitter, and uh, your handle is also mentioned uh, here as well, is... Why buy gold with U.S. stocks rising rapidly, a strong dollar, and 5% interest rates? I think that's a great starting off point. Perfect. Why, why should we buy gold, Mike? Well, it's it's obviously rhetorical because <laughs> then I answer it in there. Um, investors have been selling gold, ETF investors, but the deepest pockets on the planet have been buying, you know, central banks, most notably China, have been guy, buying gold at a colossal pace, according to the World Gold Council. I do enjoy a lot of their reports. I've been on their distribution list for at least a decade their quarterly reports and China is the largest buyer. The, the significance for for that is I think um, it's looking forward to just a little bit of normal back and fill in the U.S. stock market that's apparently unstoppable. Just a little bit potential that all this recession leanings we had last year, which was too extreme and didn't happen. And now the leanings this year are towards soft landing. It's not going to have a recession. Uh, and the Fed's going to ease, that's just starting to tilt back a little bit. To me, that's going to be a story this year. So I, I still look at in my broad commodity outlook that gold's probably going to remain one of the best performers. It's certainly out, it, typically over time, it has been outperforming most other commodities, most notably copper on a one, two, five, 10, maybe 20 year basis, depending certainly on a total return basis. But overall, I think the key thing is, um, the bottom line for gold to really put distance above two thousand dollars an ounce um, and move much higher is I think you're going to need the u s stock market people to start to realize, okay, it probably can go down, and we probably will have a recession, you know something we haven't had. I mean, and stay down. we haven't had since bottom in 2009 <laughs> that's a long time oh we've had these little corrections and the fed comes in and saves you but that's what's changed now um the fed's just not going to ease with the ease they have in the past particularly because of all the inflation they created with too much liquidity so that's it was meant to be rhetorical but so i'll end with this the key thing about gold is i think gold's ready to at some point, it had at least one dip below 2000 this year. We all kind of had to expect that. It might get more, it might make it as difficult as possible. But at some point, I think it's going to start off on a launch pad and head towards 3000. I don't know the time, <laughs> timing, but I do know what the key catalyst will be is um, to get those ETF flows to, to tilt towards inflows. Total ETF holdings have dropped to 83 million ounces. That's the same as January 2020. I mean, that's four years ago. Yet, so we've had this period of gold going up and ETF outflows, which is very rare. So I think that's going to flip at some point. And just the, the, meant, the point of the question was, well, for U.S. investors who have to keep up with indices and who, you know, if you're if you're a money manager or if you're a wealth advisor and if you're you get fired if you don't keep up the stock index, you just need a little flip in that. It's going to happen. It always does, where people start to give up in the stock market for a little while for a normal recession, and then I think gold will really win. But I have to end with this: the key thing to remember about gold is, it's really I think um, gold's almost naked nowadays if it doesn't have a little bit of digital gold, Bitcoin in that space, and we are seeing clear outflows. Uh, and gold ETFs, and there's been some selling of 
of large cap and stock indices to buy these new ETFs that track Bitcoin. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I, I, lo I love that intro question because we, we can touch on all the macro topics. <laughs> there you that, go. And yeah. I'm gonna, we're going to follow up on that. But for, for now, let's stick, stay on gold for just a, uh, just a second longer. Yeah. Um, you, you brought up the ETF holdings, and I think that is interesting because uh, you, you mentioned it's only been the central banks buying, really, but it's not the generalists. It's not the mom and pa's that are going out, and even bullion sales are down based on the World Gold Council numbers. Um, why do you think that is? Like, why has gold lost its luster um, at, at the current price level? Is it just too expensive? So people not see the upside or where is the discrepancy coming from now? I think it's it's the question. And it's that is um, if you're underweight equities and overweight gold, you've been way underperforming. And also there's this pretty significant um, cost benefit analysis of 5% T-bills in the U.S., the highest in what, 15, almost 20 years, almost 20 years. I think it was 23 and, years at some point. Yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, so it's, those are all bad for gold and there's, it makes sense. There's ETF outflows, but what does not make sense is the gold price of gold holding up. And I think that's significant because the physical buyers, number one, um, China, and, you know, kind of the, the bad guys of the world, China's tilted towards kind of the bad guys, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and there's many other buyers, but um, I don't think that stops. And there's a pretty significant war going on. There's a lot of reasons to buy gold if there's a historical measure. But here's the key thing I really enjoy pointing out, Kai. This is, we are in the middle of a paradigm shift in the world order. And that is China's, and I shouldn't say China, I'm sorry, with respect for China and its history. President Xi's tilt towards unlimited friendship with um, Vladimir and Putin of Russia, two people, of great countries and they're just tilting their countries the wrong way. Um, and that is where that buying of gold is holding up and makes sense. There'd be deep dollarization. There's $300 million of Russian assets that have been seized by Western entities. And it makes a lot of sense that they would go to old guard gold, but what's happened since then? I mean, Canada was way ahead of this game, particularly from people like Fred Pye um, and getting ETFs to track Bitcoin. The US now has, um, approved ETFs to track Bitcoin. I'm saying, not saying the U.S. has gone for the digital gold, but it has. You see what's happening. President Z has pushed back on that. Um, and the thing I always like to point out in this space, when people, I don't want to go to talk about cryptos too much, but just point out facts. I like to say Bitcoin. Who? When you track, when you look at all the sites that track cryptos, and you click on volume, the number one traded crypto is um, our dollar tokens, Tether, <laughs> and it is attract the dollar. So if you're the US and or Canada, you don't mess that up. I mean, the whole space has gone for the dollar. Absolutely. Yeah, no, the dollar is extremely strong and gold is still holding up at that point. Um, yeah. One, one follow-up question, again, allow me on, on, on gold. Like how much is gold a national security asset? That's something Grant Williams said the other day, and I, I kind of like that term. Because um, central banks are using it now. You you brought up weaponization of the SWIFT system. Now I'm throwing gold into that mix. Like how much of a pivotal role does gold still play there? Yeah, well, obviously it's increasing um, if you look at the central banks buying. But most of the central banks buying are the, the axis of bad guys, of which China decided to go that way, which is still the shock to the system. Um, and the lesson that I've learned from an economist in the last century or so, if you wanted to become wealthy in a country, you cozy up the United States, well, they just tilted the wrong way. So um, I, it, certainly some of it, I think as far as global holdings of currencies, there's a dollar, there's a euro, and then there's gold. The top three, gold is maybe what, 10 to 12%. And it's increasing, but the large holding of gold in the world are, I've seen them at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, and it's U.S. U.S. Um, government. But I, I still think it's you got to be careful. The world that's I, a book I read recently called um, "Capitalism Without Cas Capital" about the whole tilt towards intangible assets, i.e., obviously, what's the most significant on the planet, the U.S. stock market, mm -hmm. and um, crypto assets and things like that. And yeah, there's probably going to be a correction, but in a modern world, a very financially astute, advanced world, there's still I think it's the advance towards more intangible assets, which the U.S. and most of the rest of the world is uh, uh, going for in digital. And then the old guard, like Russia and China, are going for old guard gold. And I'm still bullish gold, but like I say, it's, it's still kind of, I don't, I think it's very naked without some Bitcoin in that space from an investor standpoint. Yeah, perfect. Now, I appreciate that. Let's, um, let's break down the question you posed a little bit more, because you were talking about U.S. stocks rising rapidly as well. It seems like the stock market is losing a little bit of steam in just the last couple trading sessions here. Uh, 5,000 uh, points in the S&P 500 didn't really hold. Do you see the rally continuing? It's a massive melt-up phase since we last chatted, actually. Like, we chatted early October. 
and uh, the the S and P five hundred is up twenty five percent since then. Do you see that continuing? Exactly. Or not? Classic blow off top silly stage. Now you've. Um, viewers and uh, listeners have probably heard me say that before, but this is classic blow up top season. We had the like the six month average of the VIX divided minus T bills at the lowest in 20 years. I mean, it's just the risk here is phenomenal. The way I like to point it, so we're, we're probably going to publish this on the 22nd. Thursday, yeah. we're taping on the 20th. Um, and I, the way I like to describe it is, well, at least until a few days ago with the total return S&P 500 up 6% in just a few months of the year, it's been a good year, <laughs> even on a 12 month basis. So to me, this is classic blow off top stuff. And I look at it very simplistically. I just good luck with that one. I like to point out, and I've been saying it for too long, but in the US government T-bills, you can get 5%. You haven't had that option for quite a while. So I think that some of the best performing assets this year will remain um, long bonds, treasury long bonds and gold. Um, um, particularly because it, we're way overdue for recession. The, the, the pendulum has swung so far to extreme bullishness in equities and no soft landing, yet there has been one major country to start easing yet, which is typically the sign, except for China. And why? Because they're tipping into a pretty severe depression. We can get into that in a little bit. It's just historical. I've been writing about that for two years now. It's, the world's starting to agree with it. But to me, it's here's the key thing I'd like to end with is there is an inordinate burden on the US stock market as measured by beta, S&P 500, to keep going up because if it just drops for a normal correction to say 5% or down 8% on the year, that's a severe deflationary dominoes kicking in. So we're clearly seeing it in commodities. Um, we've seen it in the inverted yield curve. We're seeing it in most property, mostly commercial property, clearly in China, in China's property market, severe deflation. I like to point out the average of PPIs and the four horsemen of the of the world, the US PPI indices, the latest ones, US, China, Japan, and Germany is minus 3%, the average, obviously led by China. And the US Fed funds rate at 5.33% gives us a spread of 8% of contraction, of pressure on economies. We've never been that wide. Now, data goes back to 1993. So I look at it as the lagging measures of inflation that the, the Fed watches are sticky. Core CPI is running around 4%, which is double their target. That ain't good. And then there's, like I said, the key thing that watch this year is a lot of us were wrong expecting for a recession to happen last year. I did not expect to get $1.6 trillion of nominal GDP growth that cost $2.5 trillion of deficit spending. Did not expect that much deficit spending, but that's how bad things are. That's part of the reason there's some in tilt and gold. But just to tilt back a little bit from this year's extreme you know, pendulum swing towards soft line is what we're going to do, I think, which makes gold one of the shiny assets. So I, I look at it and, and it's clearly, I'll end, I guess I should end with the clear case in commodities is clear deflation because you have gold is the best performing on a one-year basis up 10% and most other commodities are down, most notably industrial metals, energy, and particularly the most elastic, the grains. Absolutely. Very interesting commentary. Lots to follow up against. Like I need to, you know, go through my notes here to, to hit on all the points you just mentioned. But uh, the recession uh, recession topic, I want to stay on for just just a bit longer as well. Um, everybody's been expecting it for a while. And now it seems like the sentiment is changing on the main markets a little bit. Uh, the Fed last December said three rate cuts. The market expected seven at first. Now we're down, you know, down shifting the expectations a little bit more like five, maybe 90 basis points instead of 170 before. Yeah. Um Everything's pointing, and maybe some of the market commentators are pointing towards a no landing scenario and maybe a U.S. trampoline economy just bouncing back up and everything is honky dory after that. Um, do, do you agree or like what kind of indicators are you looking at that are still keeping you in the recession uh, to soft to hard landing camp? Well, first, let's look at human nature is the most important part of this. Um, and that is we have, and especially now, extreme way too far with agreement and recession. I should have been more astute about that. At least I was notable that commodities did the recession trade and Bitcoin did the opposite. But now the swing the other way is so extreme. So let's look at the latest data from UK's recession, the latest data from Japan's recession, the latest data from Germany's recession. Europe is basically a recession. And I do love these quotes. Oh, we're going to come out of this. I'm like, from what? Typically, it takes a long and variable lag from a significant period of Federal Reserve of central bank easing. That even even started yet. And where are they going to export to? 
China, China <laughs> needs export to them. So th this is how bad it is. It typically, that conversation of a, a, a recovery is something you're supposed to have a few years after you have a significant period of easing. We haven't even started that yet. So there's the tilt, clearly recession, and that's why I put the inordinate burden is on the U.S. doing well. So why is the U.S. doing so well? First of all, I mentioned the greatest amount on percentage basis of fiscal deficit spending ever absent a war recession. I mentioned the numbers, $1.6 trillion of nominal GDP GDP growth that costs $2.5 trillion of deficit spending. Well, I, you know, I look at a, a power from above might say, well, good luck with that one, guys, because that's not good. And then we still have a pretty significant um, hangover of the wealth effect. I mean, in, I, I look around Miami. I've only been here for three years. We see condos have almost doubled in a few years. People bought a condo to half a million. It was goes worth a million. Same with auto homes. You feel wealthy. In particular, people have, have um, refinanced. So that's still the case, um, but that's all going to fade. And it's also, we had a historic, you got to go back and study the history. The money pump, the liquidity we pump we had from 2020 to 2022 is the greatest ever, about 40% U.S. money supply, which is the contracting now. It, it, the last comparison in history, almost most significant was the 1929, 1920, basically 22 to 29 rally in the stock market. Massive liquidity that's simply inverted. And we haven't started that yet. So I think the key leading indicator is going to be the U.S. stock market going down. I've been wrong. Um, and that's why I just look at it, it's just teetering on just a little normal correction. I have little indications, like for instance, there's the S&P E mini futures. I was at a hedge fund, used to trade those, trade those a lot. Um, they have left the gap down to about 4,600. Just to put that in context right now, the price right now is 4,900. So about 9% below. That was back in December on this massive um, manic rally. It's never left a gap on a weekly chart since 1993. Never. It always goes back and fills them a few months later. So that's one of my little indicators. Of course, we have this U.S. election. I think the market's starting price for the potential for a Trump presidency. Um, the tariffs um, drill at will in in uh, uh, in, uh, in energy and crude oil. But to me, there, there's good reason. But now I think we're in that stage where it's one of those periods where if you're running money, and you're not keeping up with the indices, you get fired because it's the frenzy. I remember seeing it in 2006, seven. I was early. I remember seeing it in 99, 2000. I was early then. And we just have never had historical backdrop for what we have now, which to me is most notably bullish for gold and very bad for commodities. Uh, tomorrow, February 21st, like the day after, before we publish and the day after we record, unfortunately, right. I think NVIDIA is coming up with its numbers. Um, it feels like this is going to be like, like based on the conversation we're having, this is like the last hurrah and uh, the last, uh, what do you call it, the last fireworks going off before everything maybe turns around. Because uh, the market is like, it, it's past now uh, Tesla and options trading as well and volume in options trading. It's the most traded stock, I think, on the, on the stock market in general now. Uh, you, you mentioned frenzy. That's why I went to NVIDIA. Do, do you see an end to that? And my, the, maybe as a t uh, add on to that question is like, did you look at earnings season at all? Do you see anything that uh, could could break the camel's back here? Yeah, I don't watch that as closely. What I understood earlier in the year, we had price for the U.S. Um, S&P 5 earnings increase about 12, 10 to 12 percent year, which was quite optimistic. Um, I do like the reference to NVIDIA and options trading as an ex options trader and ex hedge fund um, trader and, and work with a lot of clients. This is the kind of environment you want to structure options for that upside potential, um, but you don't want to be stuck when it finally peaks. And trying to pick tops in this environment is like, good luck with that one. I used to have hair too. And I, so I used to try to do those kind of things. So this is where I look at it. You're just supposed to stand back and be a rational, look for what's va value. Um, and that's why I start out with, I was asked on a podcast a little while ago, if you were given a million dollars, what would you do? I can't give advice, so I can say very simply, very and very seldom in my career, certainly the last about 20 years, I've been able to say I can get 5% of T bill. The way I look at it is I think that's what the astute, astute hot money people are doing is they're loading up and sticking with it and you know trying to ride markets with calls and kind of structured options positions where you don't get crushed when the market finally mean reverts and that's all it's going to do mean revert that's what the housing market did from 2006 to 11 it just went up too far that's what stock market did 2000 1987 2008 to 9 it just mean reverted and are waiting keeping their powder dry for when we do get a normalization and to me some of the key things that's happening this year that's the paradigm shift is the fact that 
China is in decline. Um, it's way overdue for normal reversion of a rapidly expanding market, emerging market, akin, akin to some combination of the Soviet Union and Japan about 30 years ago. And we have the U.S. election and, of course, elections in many other countries. But I just look at it again. It's this inordinate burden of the U.S. stock market to keep going up. I just look at it as a trader's. At some point, we're going to get that correction to around 4,600 S&P 500. If we don't, it'll be the first time in S&P many futures that did not fill that gap. And those are silly little things. But then I look at the, uh, the fundamentals. The U.S., I like to take, uh, I started publishing on this last year. If you take the S&P 500 index and um, you divide by U.S. GDP, just add two zeros to U.S. GDP, it's been a, on a, a basically a, a good measure of S&P 500 since 1928. And just recently, it's the most expensive since 1930. And then you look at the stock market versus the rest of the world, MSCI XUS. It's the most expensive ever. Okay, our data goes back 50 years there. Uses housing, it's the most expensive ever versus sales, the most expensive ever. It's a classic feeding frenzy. And you have to expect the rules of monetary policy not to work, meaning we just had the greatest. But a delay makes sense. It's certainly starting to kick in most of the rest of the world. The U.S. is a shining star. How long is that going to last? Monetary policy, the last question I want to ask you before we go towards the commodities a bit more, QT versus QE. Um, last time we talked in back back in October, you said the Fed was done uh, hiking rates and, and done tightening as well. Um, just just given what we discussed and sort of the indicators we're seeing, do you, do you expect it one more rate hike before the rate cuts or no. are we done with all of that? So, But I'm enjoying it. Kikai, I enjoy part of that hype and that's part of what some people on my side of the business have to do to get clicks uh, if another fed hike would be a shock and the fed is not in, in the business of creating shocks in the market they do have inflation going their way they do have unemployment starting to tick up and if you look at things like diesel demand in this country it's the same as 2015 it's stagnant most long the longest period in our database unleaded gas is demand paperboard boxes are demand in my space it's a clear recession kicking in so that's just kind of the funny things to look at so i look at my fed um, fed fund screen on the terminal right now the wrp function it says probably a hundred percent chance they're going to cut rates by in at the june 12th meeting but i do enjoy um by the time we this hits the tape i'll enjoy i'll be publishing the point that if you're the fed and you see the stock market and a frenzy higher you see all these crypto assets in a frame higher highly speculative actions crude oil up 10% to this year. Why would you ease? <laughs> it's silly. They wouldn't even consider it. It's, it would just be silly. And with sticky inflation, the latest inflation data in this country, core inflation is running about double the target and it's starting to tick up a liter. Now, I think it's a short-term tick. I fully expect severe, but when we have this meeting next year, when we talk next year, I fully expect deflationary forces be the problem and that whole world trying to catch up to an enduring trend. It's already happening in commodities. It's already happening in China, the second largest country. Um, but to me, that's that's the, the tilt that uh, they're just not going to ease with the ease. And one thing we've enjoyed for it's almost been two years now that the ease was a, a year out or less. And so I like to point out that was, um, I think it was the beginning, oh yeah, beginning of 23, that if you look at the Fed funds futures, the one year, spread it started pricing for 100 basis points of cuts in january of 2023 and guess what we've had since there 100 price 100 basis points of hikes so this is a vigilant fed they're going to win with deflation because the forces are so deflationary right now i can jeff booth a great um, canadian wrote the book the price of tomorrow it's all showing up in commodities and it's just a matter of time so i think the the risk is in the past the fed used to raise rates on the escalator and drop rates on the elevator. And they did the opposite this time. We raised them the fastest pace in history on a global basis. And when they do start cutting, they'll go down on the, um, on the escalator. And I think that's part of what I think is a way overdue, normal recessionary period. Unfortunately, it's global. And by the way, that's already happening in China. They're cutting and creating as much stimulus as they po possibly can. I'll end with this. The Hong Kong, Hong Kong Shanghai index is I think the same as 10 years ago, imagine if that was in this country, even longer than that. And it's the lowest level versus the S&P 500 since 1995 when Chairman Mao was the chairman. And President Xi is going back to a lot of those Mao type um, economic, uh, I would say, rules. I mean, and they're very much top down autocratic. Just, just sticking with symbolism for one more second, um, the, the symbol of a, key, of, of a Fed rate cut as well like is that adding fuel to the recessionary fire like is that admitting yeah. is that just adding to it like admitting okay so the economy I, is not doing great what what, what kind I, of symbol or what kind of like, message would that send as well 
I, I love the example of, I remember it well, the, um, the two last significant cuts I remember that started cycles was January, first week of January 2001, and September of 2007. Remember what happened those periods afterwards? Pretty much beginning of severe deflationary stock market correction periods. Maybe it's different this time. Here's the difference, is the stock market now versus GDP is more expensive than I said in the 1930s. It's more expensive <laughs> than any of those periods in the past. That's the US stock market. It's more expensive, it's, it depends on how you look at it. People call earnings, I'm like, yeah, that's one thing. There's, you gotta admit, I do, um, the ability for humans to create more with less and create value out of equities is wonderful, like intangible assets. But on a, on a relative value basis, even housing, it's just so expensive. Um, that's the difference. And when they start cutting rates, um, there's that risks, the, the, the lessons of cutting too early um, and getting that inflation that remains sticky. And that to me is part of the reason there's, like I said, with the bottom line is when the, we have an economy very much based on intangible assets, much more than tangible assets in the past. And the number one measure in tangible assets on the planet, the S&P 500, keeps going up. It's kind of unusual to expect inflation to go down in that environment. So that's what it's going to take. That's why I think this is a lose-lose for commodities. Mm -hmm. And I look at it as well, thank you very much. What's that T-bill give me? Five point what percent? Two percent? Thank you very much. I just, some point you're supposed to just say thank you and turn off CNBC and go for a picnic. Sounds like a great idea. Talk to you later, Mike. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Sorry about that. But, that, <laughs> but that's the key thing. That's what we do. That's what people do is we are impatient. We don't make a living. We got to talk about something. And, oh, and um, Social media made it so much worse. And, and saying it's... It, well, oh yeah, exactly. It's but it it is, and it's also defining different environments. I mean, I, one thing I do now is I I love in in Miami. Now I don't go anywhere without this in my ear, listening to a podcast or a book or something that's going to make me act seem smarter. <laughs> <laughs> or listening to you, uh, but that's how the world's changed. It's just, it, it, it makes it more extreme. But the bottom line from uh, uh, what's happening in the markets now is I think we're going to look back at this as somewhat the silly stage. Exactly. Last year, it just was too much of a pendulum swing. At this point last year, let's, let's, let's end with this. The S&P 500 was about a 20% discount from its all-time high last year. So what happened? It just swung back a little. Now, you can't say that. And what's the problem? Everybody's so bullish. I'm like, okay, what's the risk? Eh, we just tilt back a little. <laughs> Absolutely. Let, let, let's segue to commodities, and I think the best way yeah. to do it is talk copper. And uh, let's talk about what the copper price action currently tells you. Let me open it here as well. We're at 386. It's bouncing back a little bit. Um, I wouldn't say it's optimistic because it's bouncing around that 370 level, been, or it's been in that range for a while now. Um, what, what does Gar uh, Dr. Copper tell you as the recession indicator? Uh, bar Three bucks. I think three bucks before four bucks. So the, the thing that suck about copper is 386 or seven less per pound. First traded that price in 2006. Imagine if we said that about the stock market. Copper is a pendulum swinging commodity and the number one source of demand, so, demand source the last 20 years has been China. And China's in the depression kicking in. They're completely subject to massive fiscal monetary stimulus just to stay alive. And they just pissed off their best customers by unlimited friendship before war in Europe, Europe in the US. Like, this is just classic historic. So copper's right in the middle. So I think right now, the, I looked at it recently, I think re, um, good resistance, is, which was five and 450 is now moving down to four. It needs to sustain above four to show any type of life. Um, and I think it's more likely to head to three. Three is an enduring mean. It doesn't really matter much. If you look at the average, I just plugged in since 2005, the average is 312. And uh, it's, it's nothing. Three means nothing in copper. And I like to use the example of, um, U.S. natural gas. U.S. natural gas, the number one measure of heat, electricity, and fertilizer in this country. Obviously, it's a little more supply elastic, but it dropped the same price as 1990. The price right now on the screen, 157. The first day it traded in April uh, 1990 was 164, and it's below that price. That's what happens in commodities. Copper is no different. Um, so it needs some kind of supply shock, and we had a little bit with that in Panama recently, but usually those supply shocks kick in. So I fully expect copper and crude oil, which are getting these wedge patterns, might might squeeze people a little bit on the outside, but I think they're going to break down. And if you really compare industrial metals as a, as a group, I look at the Bloomberg Industrial Metals um, index, it's down 13% in one year, down 22% in a two year basis. Nickel's part of that. Um, and the nickel's been the high flyer. Aluminum is in there. Aluminium, if we want to use it in British version, they're all heading lower. What's going to stop that? Typically, you need a long and variable lag to a decent amount of central bank easing. And I like to look at examples of demand pull. Okay, there's a problem in, in China with its best exports. And 
customers and with the property crisis, which is way overdue. I mean, the property crisis peak in 2015 in China was about four times GDP, according to the book, The Price of Time. I forget the author. Um, it was about the same as Japan was. I remember I was worked for a Japanese firm in the early 90s, and I remember running around that Imperial Palace and it was the same value as the state of Arizona. So it's, it's all happening, but it's, um, it's all going that way. And the thing is, if you look at crude oil compared to industrial metals, the equivalent price right now would be closer to 60. And I know you might push back in a little bit. The equivalent <laughs> price versus natural gas would be closer to 40. The equivalent price versus corn and most grains would be closer to about 45. Interesting. Okay, because yep. you mentioned before we hit the record button, I'd love to discuss oil because I personally think it should be trading at 95 and not yeah. 78. So well, the follow-up is I now... I ask like, you, Kai, do you have a vested interest? No. Do no, I'm just looking at... Oh, like, I don't know much about the oil, you... so it's all geopolitically different for me. Like, Yeah. When I look at it. Well, and... I, I have to ask you, because typically it's one thing I join this space, is typically it's people who are, have a vested interest in commodities going up will make those kind of statements, which I, you, I'm sure you have good views for that. But if you look at the lessons of commodities, most, again, notable from, here's two books, The Price of, of Tomorrow by Jeff Booth, how the pressure of rapidly advancing technologies is pressuring all prices, most notably commodities, and The Domino Effect by uh, Russell Brazil, I think was his name. It's about how the, the, the ability to frack and shale and to build a normal drill down, maybe three or four drills, and then go horizontal, four miles, <laughs> for maybe 10 springs. It's just, uh, don't underestimate the technology. And then you have issues like um, uh, the world's largest, let's, uh, let's give some facts about crude oil. The U.S. and Canada, liquid fuels supply and excess of demand. I say liquid fuels, obviously it's crude oil, ethanol, biofuels, um, is about 6 million barrels a day. That was a deficit of about 10 million barrels a day when crude oil peaked at, at 145 in 2008. And if you add that, you know what that 6 million barrels is? It's roughly equivalent to the increasing OPEC surplus. Why do they have a surplus? Because they're trying to cut back supply. They're cutting back in their production, and which is boosting prices, which is increasing <laughs> supply in the rest of the world. It's a lose-lose. So here's what's going to happen to crude oil, in my view. The number one way to shut off production in U.S. shale in Canada is low prices. Every single time crude oil collapsed below 40, it shut it down and went back up. I think it's going to $40 a barrel. I've said it two years ago. I was early. If I was a trader, I would have been wrong. Um, but now I look at it, I'm putting it kind of as a fill or kill this year because I think by the end of this year, it's all going to make sense. And then there's this issue with what if Mr. Trump wins the presidency, drill at will, comes back. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a, my, my interest in oil is more from the mining side. Like I'm a mining investor and uh, uh, I want margins to increase, not decrease. So mm-hmm, actually yeah. I, have a, I, I actually should have an interest at $40 go, uh, oil uh, as well. So but well, you uh, know I'm just looking at blame. the geopolitical you know who, landscape. You know, so. you know who to blame if it does go to your target at 95. So right now, geopolitical premium in crude oil is about 20 bucks, $25. It's $79 a bill as we speak. I think we're near the upper end of the range, around 80 in WTI. And again, I go to natural gas. People, there's always little reasons, but I just say, well, in this country, I mean, in most of Canada too, it's just the number one source. Heat, <laughs> electricity, and fertilizer. Just look at corn. It's collapsing. Why? Because the cost of production is declining. Why? Because in also technology. Um, but also, and then that's, it's, it, it's, I think you have to be careful when people use it in a pure supply and demand crude oil basis. Look at the macro. Here's the one pressure. So I look at it when I used to write a hedge fund, I, I sometimes did the value at risk models. When you're doing your value at risk model, your VAR model, and you're, you're assessing your positions, the number one thing you think you have to worry about for crude oil in terms of other markets is what we're seeing on the screens today. It's a little correction in the stock market. If the S&P 500 just corrects 5%, crude oil is going to drop probably 15 10, 15%, unless there's some kind of supply shock, which means it'll just drop later because it'll make it worse for everyone. So right now, at the point we're standing right now, is the bounce in crude oil, this this now is happening very similar to when it peaked at $95 in September. Um, it took away some Fed easing that was in the market. The Fed came out vigilant, and then everything turned lower, and it was right before the um, Hamas invasion and the Hamas-Israeli war. Now, there's a reason for it to be pumped. But right now, the main forces that pressure crude oil for the last since 2008 is the excess of supply and demand out of the U.S. and Canada. And then I point out things like diesel, unleaded gas, um, container board boxes. All those are in complete downward recessionary trajectories compared to past um, past performance. Fantastic. And they're very interesting. Like there's so, so many facets playing into it. It's been become so multifaceted. It's not as simple anymore as it used to be. Mike, I have one yeah. last question to follow up on. And um, 
you, you mentioned the the housing crisis in China, and uh, we we discussed that, and that's why I'm bringing it back up the Evergrande debacle. My, my big question is, and since we we discussed it in the past, why hasn't it caused bigger issues worldwide? Why was it just already priced in? Why did the three hundred billion dollar um, implosion not cause a bigger ripple effect? It's just getting started. I think it's early days. So let's put ourselves a year ago. Complete recession was the assumption, and China coming out of the um, the COVID lockdowns and recovering, and everything, all commodities are going to go up. Completely wrong. Um, and so I look at there was one. I just read the book called The Party. Forget the author. All about the history of the Chinese Communist Party. I read uh, numerous books. One thing that really touched me off m many years ago was reading The Great Rupture by Victor Shevitz, uh, how China is a history of reverting back to inwardness, which Chairman Z is completely doing. And the property crisis, the extent of it. It was also another book with the price of time, um, like the price of tomorrow, but the price of time pointing to how and when you have no other investments and interest rates are very low and you only have one choice, you buy multiple properties. So what happened in 2015 or so, President Z redirected, um, pulled away uh, from property markets, said people shouldn't be speculating and then tilted a lot of banking assets and uh, resources towards EVs and solar and things. So where you've seen a lot of um, a lot of deflation on a global basis. Just ask um, ask um, Europe. They're doing everything they can. Respect all those cheap cars coming out of China, EVs, because it's crushing the, their old technology of internal combustion. Um, so to me, this is just a classic case of a market that just went way too far. It's simple mean reversion, but it's historic. Um, and it's just a matter of time. And the key thing I keep watching is there is a tradable bond that's going to happen in, in Chinese equities. I mean, I think China's just going to keep throwing every liquidity at it that they can. Like I said, the low in the HSI, I'm sorry, the Hong Kong, Hong Kong HSI index, Hong Kong Shanghai index, the, the price right now versus S&P 500 is the same as 1975. <laughs> That's yeah. if we said that. It's just shocking. So there'll be a bounce. They'll just keep throwing more liquidity at but I think it's going to just be meet into responsive sellers. People are saying, thank you, let me out. It's that bad. No, no, here's one example. Um, we lived it. A lot of us did. I worked for Japanese firms and the Chinese, the Japanese economy jumped really rapidly to four trillion dollars of GDP to 1989 and 90. It's still four trillion dollars, and this and the uh, Nikkei's finally catching up to those levels. That's what we can look for in China. And they didn't start a war. They didn't tilt over to the bad guys. I didn't say they started, but they didn't do an unlimited friendship with the bad guys and and buy gold and push off in their the best import the best import country in the world, which is the U.S. and in Europe. So it's it's way overdue. I don't know what saves them. Um, property crisis is just part of it, but it's it's there's three, you know, pick off the three boxes, exports, property crisis, consumer sentiment, stock market. Okay, yeah, there's a bounce, but um, yeah, China is just, no, it's normal reversion, way overdue. Um, but the key thing I have to point out is um, it's one person. And that's what I, it, every time I, when I read the book, The Party, I, I wish I, I can't remember the author right now. I, it just reminded me of everything I read in Atlas Shrugged um, by Ayn Rand about 20 years ago. That, it's just that kind of sentiment, that kind of actions. And I show it in the data. Fantastic. Mike, phenomenal insights again. Really appreciative of your time. Really, really thank you so much for that. Where, where can we find more of your work? Where can we follow you, Mike? Um, on Twitter at Mike McGlone 11 and uh, on LinkedIn, Mike McGlone, Senior Commodity Strategist at Bloomberg. And if people are interested, I'm happy to reach out and I'm happy to put them on my distribution list. Fantastic. Well, Mike, please add me to your list. I always get your material sent there through somebody else. So I want well, to be a direct be... receiver. I'll add you. And uh, thank you for having me on, Kai. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to our next, our next meeting and interview and see how things have worked out. Absolutely. Likewise. It was fantastic. Really, really great insights. Mike, really appreciate your time and uh, everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. We, I, I truly hope you enjoyed this discussion as much as I have. Lots and lots of good content in there. Uh, maybe you want to slow it down, break it down. I'll do my best to provide timestamps as well. But uh, make sure to follow Mike on Twitter. Follow him on Bloomberg, of course, as well. And if you like the discussion, please leave a like, leave a comment. It helps us tremendously you know, shape the format, invite great guests like Mike on the program as well. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching. We'll be back with lots, lots more. Thank you.